Hello and welcome to a brand new episode of Happy Mum, Happy Baby, the podcast. Today we have an Ocado special because you've got two ambassadors with you today. Uh, so no doubt we'll be talking about food at some point. Today's guest is an actress. I grew up watching her on my screen and absolutely adored her. She's also a celebrity chef and a presenter. <laughs> and she has a, a daughter, a teenage daughter, which is something I will never know anything about other than my own experiences. Today's guest is Lisa Faulkner. Hello. Hello. How are you? I'm very well. I'm just reeling from the fact that my daughter turned 15 ye uh, yesterday, no, Monday. So it's just like I, I now have a 15 year old. Just Does that terrifying. Feel really strange. Yeah, it's just mad. It really is. Um, everything, and I have two stepchildren who are 15. Well, I have four, but the older ones are much older. But um, 15 and 17, and two 15 year old girls, it's. Um, it's it's challenging. <laughs> it's always challenging or interesting. It's an yes. interesting time. Your voice always goes slightly up. <laughs> <laughs> and also, you're sitting in your daughter's room right now. Are you secretly looking around going, oh, she's not done this, she's not done that? Uh, I spend the whole time going... Oh, I asked her to move that. I find piles of washing that I've bought up clean and folded into her room. And when she hasn't bothered to put them away, they're either under her bed or back in the washing basket. And I can already <laughs> see some. You're going to have to resist the urge as we talk to just like pick things up and sort it out. Because that's totally what I I'm feeling feel the need to do. Yeah, I mean, I'm constantly in here like tidying up and she's like, leave my stuff alone. <laughs> but yeah. So what was your childhood like? Because I, So I've read your book, Meant to Be. I haven't actually read it. I've listened to it. Uh, and I've absolutely oh. loved listening. Because I just think it's that thing of when you listen to the author, especially a book like that, telling it, it's so much more personal. Do you know what I mean? Um, yeah, so I've I absolutely do. absolutely loved it. Um, and your childhood, you would describe it at one point as idyllic. Um, but your mum sounds like, a, like she was a right character as well. She really was. My childhood up until the age of... I'd say about 14 was like a perfect childhood. We went on lovely little holidays. We didn't have a lot of money, but we had a really lovely family dynamic. It was me, me my mum, my dad and my sister. And it was just, everything was lovely. It, I sort of have so many memories of just joyous food memories, going out, little holidays. And then um, my mum got ill. My mum had cancer and she died when I was 16. And my life really turned around. Um, but my mum was a complete force of nature. She was loud and she, she wore her heart on her sleeve. If, you know, she was quite angry when she was angry, she was angry. When she was happy, she was so happy. So, yeah, I grew up with this real energy ball of, of a woman who was very strong and just very driven and you know, food obsessed and style obsessed and um, quite amazing. I mean, I think I probably have rose tinted glasses in some way. <laughs> so did you always think that you would become a mum? Was that something that you ever thought about when you were younger? I just assumed that I would. Yeah. You know, I think we all spend our childhood growing up playing mums, yeah. playing with your dollies. Um, then you get to teenage years and... You know, as I got older, people would say, well, how many kids do you want? And I'd say, I want five and I want this or I want two girls and a boy. Um, and you just think it's going to happen. Um, so I did. I just assumed that I would. But I wasn't really obsessed with having kids until I couldn't have kids. And then I became quite obsessed with it. Well, before that as well, what I, what I absolutely love reading about was you um, being your sister's birth partner. Yeah, um, my sister is my absolute anchor my rock she's two years younger than me and we are best mates um we i did argue when we were kids and i have scars on my hands to prove how much we used to have my fight sister and has scrap. scars on her hands that's so funny does she yeah. <laughs> like from where we used to yes. dig our nails into each other <laughs> Yeah, we horrible were awful. children we are. <laughs> yeah, horrible. Um, but she's she was so lovely. And when she got pregnant, we were I was so excited that she was going to have a baby. And 
she was she took to she was really young when she had um Lola she was like 23 um and so she was just it was just amazing that this child you know she was growing this child and then she said would I be birth partner and I said yes um and it was just incredible um and then she went on to have another child another two children and I was birth partner for all of them so I feel like I got to be to witness three births, three amazing births, um, two in a hospital and one in a pool, which was incredible, in a birthing yeah. pool. And just basically be um, the auntie that buys dry clean only clothes because I thought that silk was beautiful <laughs> and buy buy them all the teddy tu- telly tubbies when they wanted one. And my sister's like, why have we got all of them now? And I'm like, you know, I was just the auntie that spoiled, spoiled my nieces and nephew. Yeah. It must be like, especially because back then, it's not like you would have been watching One Born Every Minute. So going into that scenario, like how prepped were you (laughs) to see a baby coming out? I had no idea. I had no idea. I had no idea about the placenta. That was the... That was what really threw me. I was like, is, is that another baby? <laughs> what the hell is that? <laughs> um, but This one doesn't look so good. <laughs> good. Yeah, I mean, you just, you know, and also I was in my 20s and I just thought, what, what's going on? What, you know, it was just, but it was so magical. And obviously I'd done, read the books that she'd asked me to read and done the homework. And her, her um, partner, who's now her husband, was there as well. Um, but it was just... I, I think I was just amazed. I just fell in love as soon as Lola came out. I was completely obsessed. And the second time she got pregnant, she she gave birth. Me and my best friend had been out partying and Victoria phoned me to say, you've got to come. And I was so drunk that I had to get in a car. And I was so hot by the time I got there because I was in an alcoholic sweat that she had to give me her birthing T-shirt. <laughs> Because I was like in a jumper and I was like, Victoria, I'm so hot. She went, oh my God, I can't believe it. So she gave birth in <laughs> she a knew gown. you were drunk. <laughs> yes. She looked at me and she went, you're drunk. And I went, no, I'm not. I'm fine. I'm fine. <laughs> I can do this. It's totally fine. Free, free, it's free. fine. I've done it before. <laughs> <laughs> so what I, those those um, experiences, though, they, they didn't have an effect on you kind of going, I want this now. It was later on where, where that was that even entered your head. Yeah, I mean, I was such a... I was working from such a young age. I started mm-hmm. working when I was 16. I was a model. And then I started acting when I was 19. And so I was working and loved... Love, still love my career, but kids weren't... Kids were going to happen, but much further on. And actually, when um, Ava, Victoria's second, was born, I I had was in a sort of relationship and thought, oh, I quite maybe we could have kids, but it was a real maybe. It wasn't there. It was still so far off in the future. And it wasn't until a couple of years later that I so I think I probably got to about thirty thirty one, and it just I I met I met my ex husband. I was like, right, this is it. But I imagine also, though, with your career, like, I think when, when anything in, in the entertainment industry, it's quite hard for women a lot of the time to kind of go, I'm carving out this time. Anyway, in the in the perfect world, if you could carve out time to, to fall pregnant and have a baby, you know, you it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's really difficult to, to remove yourself from a career that you've worked so hard to build. I, I totally agree. I mean, I think that's that's what it was. And I was playing leads and I had series and it was brilliant. And I thought, if I get pregnant, then that's all going to stop and somebody else is going to come up and take my place. There's, there's always, there's a million actresses, um, all very good. And so, yeah, there was a lot of that thing of when is the right time? Mm. Um, there never is a right time, is there? Anyway, yep. but um, but I think there was that. And there was a sort of thing of until... I feel like I'm ready for that to switch. I'm not ready. Yeah. And then what was it like when you started eventually trying? Was it was it a case of actually being quite relaxed about the whole thing at the start? Because we are yeah. we growing up, you were told so much, don't get pregnant, don't get pregnant, don't get pregnant. So when there is that switch, you're kind of, well you just think it's going to happen straight away because, you know, you've been told not to for so long, but now you can. So 
that's all good. Do you know, do you know, even now when I, I mean, you know, I'm heading towards the end of any sort of periods and things. And I think, I still think, oh God, imagine if I suddenly got pregnant. And I think, why is my brain thinking that when I, <laughs> it just has never happened for me. Um, I think you, you're absolutely right that while you're at school, it's constant. This, this sex education is about getting pregnant. Yeah, not not getting pregnant mm-hmm. and taking the pill and then you know you start your life and I, so I I just thought well I'll come off the pill and I'll get pregnant I didn't think there'd ever be an issue um, and of course then I did come off the pill and I think I was off the, off the pill for, for ages and nothing happened at all and then finally I did get pregnant. But it ended up being an ectopic pregnancy. So, I mean, I found out I was pregnant and then it was all right. For, I think it was about three or four days of fine. And then I started feeling a bit funny and I was filming. Mm. And I went into onto set and I told, I said to my um, lovely Caroline Katz, who I was working with, and I said, I feel really weird. And I told her, I said, I'm pregnant, but I feel really odd. And she said, it's just the beginning. That's what happens. You know, don't worry about it. And I said, no, I've got these really weird pains. And she was like, OK. And then I suddenly felt like I couldn't see. I, I felt really weak and faint. And the next thing I was on the floor in the middle of a rehearsal. We're just about to go to for a take. And I yeah. blacked out. And um, I went back into my little trailer and the nurse came and he said to me, have you got any pain in your in your shoulder? And I went, no. I said, I'm, t- I'm pregnant. And he went, have you got pain in your shoulder or pain in your back? And I said, no, I've got no pain there. And he said, we need to get you to hospital straight away. Mm. And he thought it was an ectopic, and it was an ectopic. But I, what I hadn't realised, um, which I say in my book, is that I'd never heard the word ectopic. I'd never heard because it's an ectopic pregnancy. People keep saying, oh, it's an ectopic pregnancy. So I kept hearing the word pregnancy. So I thought, okay, well, there's still pregnancy, so it should be fine. Yeah. And when they told me that it was growing in my tube and not in the womb, I was, I thought maybe they could move it. I ha- Nobody sort of explained anything until I was going into theatre. Mm. Nobody explained anything. And it was terrifying. And so I just awful I think that's the thing isn't it? I think you only learn those things when you're going through it because when you yeah. are trying to get pregnant you're so you go into it so innocently there's a naivety to it and unless you've had friends who have gone through it and even then a lot of people especially years ago they used to keep it all very private you know it was, it was a, it's a very lonely grief I think when you've gone through a miscarriage or an ectopic or baby yeah. loss or anything like that um and it, it, it is scary because you've got no idea what's going on and all of a sudden that hope that came flooding in, it's got nowhere to go. No, it was such a sense of doom and failure yeah. and just darkness. And to be in agony because I'd had a tube removed and they tried to go in through um, keyhole surgery and in the end they couldn't so they had to cut me. So I ended up having what's ultimately a, a caesarean scar, which was so annoying and have nothing to show for it yeah and what was it like for you moving forward like was it a, was it something that took a while or were you at that point you'd had a, a almost a, a taster if you like of what that was gonna feel like so did you just want to plow on and, and yeah I, I wanted to be better yeah. immediately it took me a few months to get out of sitting on the sofa and once I got my head around the fact that I've got to move on. I wanted to feel better so that then I could see what was next open to me. And I'd already spoken to the doctor and the doctor said, look, you need to give it a year. You've got one tube because I lost a tube. But there's absolutely no reason why you can't get pregnant um, naturally. Mm. So let's give it a year and then we can look into IVF. And I was like, okay, well, within six months, nothing had happened. And that was long enough for me. And I, was, yeah. I thought, right, I need to really kickstart this because your brain is, right, once you've started that you want to have a baby, I want to have a baby, yeah. that you're on a roller coaster. And that's it. So I just went, 
what do I do next? And my doctor had said, well, you can have, um, oh my gosh, what's the drug? Clomid. Clomid. There you go. Um, yeah, you can have Clomid. And so I started, I started that thinking, well, here we go. This is the first sort of thing I can do to have a baby. You know, we, I'd not, I hadn't been drinking. I'd started really looking after myself already. And, um, so we took, I took Clomid and it was terrifying because I turned into a monster. Uh, I, I don't, I don't know really how, how else to describe it. I literally within a couple of hours of taking that pill, I was in tears and then I had this raging anger and it was just, it just didn't work for me. Whatever it was, yeah. it was crazy. Well, the last thing and, you want to um, do when you feel like that is have sex. Have, exactly. <laughs> your partner at the time, like, I don't want to have sex with this angry, crazy woman that's in front of me. Exactly. <laughs> and I'm going, what time are you back from football? Because I'm I'm weighing on sticks and I'm right and I've got to, we've got to do it now. And I'd be like, literally the poor man would be walked through the door and I'd be, there's, there's no, there's no nothing yeah. ex- sexy about it. It was just literally like, come on, we've got to have a baby. We're going to do this now. It's the, the time is right. The sticks say I'm fertile, and and so yeah, that that was the beginning of a long line of um, of trying. Yeah, well, because after Clomid, then you went down. Did you do IUI first? Or did you yes, skip? You did we did IUI, IUI well. first. Um, and and every time going through that journey, every time you start on another one, you go, well, this one will work because everyone says I can get pregnant naturally. And I did get pregnant. So there's no reason that I can't. Um, so then, yeah, then I was like, OK, so so this will work. And we did IUI and it didn't work. And actually, it was sort of a real waste of money. Right. And I I sort of feel now I should have just skipped the IUI and gone straight to IVF. But. Maybe I wasn't ready. Maybe I needed to to exhaust all the avenues before I got to to the IVF. And we had a, a pot of money. I had my savings and I knew how many savings I had. And that was it. That was what, so I knew that I could probably do three goes of IVF. And so then we started on on the IVF roller coaster. Mm. But you never thought you'd get to that third one? No. No, no, I thought that first, I thought I was going to be pregnant on the first time and then that would be fine. And I'd probably have loads of embryos that I could then go back to if I needed to. You know, I just didn't, I just was so positive about yeah. it. Um, and so the, when the first, when I first had my first round of IVF, I took an acting job. I literally had my embryos put back and I got in a car to Manchester and the next day I was on set on my feet for like a 14 year 14 hour day in in a courtroom and I was thinking afterwards it's the most stupid thing you've just you know you're meant to be looking after yourself and I was learning lines and really stressed and whatever and I did blame myself a lot because obviously it didn't work but you know, a lot of the time you, you're told, oh, it will work, it's fine, don't worry about it. You just move, you know, you can do, live a normal life and have IVF. But I think probably filming isn't isn't that normal of a life. Yeah. And, <laughs> and yeah, and it, and I, out of the nine people in my round of people that were taking, doing, doing it the same day as me, um, nine out of the, there were 10 of us and nine of them were pregnant and I was the only one that wasn't. So it was really awful. Thank God that there were no WhatsApp groups at the time yeah. because it would have been awful. Yeah, I mean, that would definitely be one to leave. Yeah. <laughs> leave that chat. Yeah. From that point, you started thinking about surrogacy. But eventually you ended up on adoption. <laughs> yeah. But we that's went my all around reason. the houses. This is what I love, though, because <laughs> you go into one thing and, like I said, you properly research that area and... Like, is this how I'm going to become a mum? Is this how it's going to happen? Yeah, I mean, I say that I researched it. I have to say I researched it with the mind of a mental... Like, I just felt like I was, like, mentally There's unstable. this desperation as well, isn't there? When that's it, some, exactly. something that you want. Yeah, I just wanted it. And I was like, how do I get it? OK, let's look at surrogacy. And then... I realised after a long time that surrogacy was not going to work for us and there's a whole thing in the book about how it worked. And actually, it's much easier now than it was. Um, And so then the next step was adoption and we looked at 
adoption in America and we looked at adoption overseas and then I came to the conclusion that actually adoption in in the UK was what, where we were going to be and and actually it was my ex-husband who said to me what is the difference between having a baby he said I could go away filming for eight months you could tell me you were pregnant and I might not see you apart from a couple of times and then you pan me a baby and I love it so what's the difference and that was the sort of starting point for me to think well maybe I could adopt and how much I love my friends and my my family and my friends kids and my nieces and nephews and you know it sort of got to a point where I thought I kept asking myself that question how can I love and what does that mean and what does becoming a mother mean does it is it about carrying a baby or is it about nurturing a mm. child you know and so yeah it's a lot to get your head around adoption is a lot it's a minefield and it is huge but I got my head around it and then we went through the adoption process. You went to an an adoption exhibition as well, which seemed to give you a lot of answers as well and open your eyes to exactly what that meant. And what I loved hearing you say was about how your mind almost shifted from your desire to to being a mum to actually or having a baby, but actually what that child needs about them in their own sort of narrative. Yeah, it was it was really amazing to suddenly see that it wasn't about me. Mm. But actually, it was about a child. And it was about if I was going to adopt, what that would mean and how you were, what your capacity as a mother would be and how everything is about the child. Everything is about what your child has been through before they come to you and how you can help and support and love them forever. Yeah. And it's a it's a big thing to get your head around. And the reason that the adoption process is is a long process and that there are so many workshops is because you really need it. You really need it. It's not something to be taken lightly. And anyone that goes, oh, you can just adopt that. It's not it's not about all oh, just adopting, because when you're adopting, your child is going to come with so much with trauma. There is always going to be an element of trauma. And so if you're thinking that you're going to be handed a baby that's fine and that's the end of your story and their life starts there it's it, you've got to leave all of that at the door and realize that once you're handed your child that's the beginning of the healing process for them it's not the end of the story it's not like oh they found a family so that's all right bye bye now yeah it's not the happy all. ending it's the start no it's the beginning yeah, yeah. i mean what was it like when you were told that your daughter was going to, well, first of all, be coming to stay with you initially. Because there must be so much worry within that as well, because although you go to all these workshops and in a way you know what to expect, but when you're actually living it, I imagine it takes on a whole other, um, well, a whole other world. Absolutely. It's a completely different thing to saying, oh, yes, we can do this, to actually doing it. But the minute they they told us that there was a child that they thought we would be really well matched with. I was like, I I can't wait to to meet her. And, um, and, you know, they show you a little, they showed, the social worker came and met us and then showed us a picture of her. And I was like, oh my gosh, that's, that's her. (laughs) That's, that's my daughter. Um, But I did keep, and I had post-it notes on my fridge. And every day I knew that what would be best for my daughter was not going to be decided by me. And that all I could do was look after her. I was going to fall in love with her. It, it was just going to happen anyway. And so it, it, it's really difficult and it is bittersweet. And I I am very mindful when I talk about it because there's not just me involved. And yeah. so therefore, it's, you know, the adoption process is a hard process. It's a hard for adopters. It's hard for birth family and it's hard... For, the hardest on the child I've and got to so, say the first time I've ever heard anyone reference the birth family in terms of adoption was when reading your book yeah there are many people that hold yeah. my daughter's hand that are so important in her life and one I will never take that away or hide it um but it's that's my daughter's story and I am very private yeah 
about it because yeah. of her. Yeah. What was it like when you first met her? Um, it it was d just amazing. I mean, to see this little pixie playing peekaboo through the door, and I was like. There she is, and she was so tiny, and but a fully formed person, and she was, you know, seventeen months, and just oh my gosh, incredible! It was amazing, and her coming to live with us was, you know, it's it, the adoption process is that you have you have a, like a moving in process that takes about between five and seven days, right? And so I think on day five she'd moved in. And, you know, we'd done all the thing of putting her to bed or going o over in the morning to the foster carer's house to see how it all worked. And, uh, you know, it, it was just incredible. It was, it, she was, you know, I just felt, I remember just falling so in love with her, just falling so in love with her and thinking, wow, this has hit me like a wave and I didn't quite expect it because, you know, I was sort of on my guard for a bit, like you know, what's going to happen, I don't know what's going to happen, and then suddenly it was like, <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> I've fallen. <laughs> I've gone. That's it. I've <laughs> fallen. Yeah. Yeah. And how long was it until you got the news that she would be staying with you? I think it probably took about eight eight months before we got to actually adopt her. And as I always say, bittersweet, because, you know, for us it was a wonderful moment. For the other people involved, it was a heartbreaking moment for Billy. It was, you know, a um, life-changing moment forever. So it's full of emotion. Yeah, yeah. What was it like finally having your child? It was like all my birthdays and Christmases and everything I could possibly want came at once. The fact that I could put my daughter in a buggy that I could take her to a shop and we could put her in a high chair and she could have while well, we had a coffee and she could have a bun or something like all those tiny little things taking her to change her nappy in a in a cafe um letting her dress up because she wouldn't go to round you know the supermarket without being in a costume of some kind um all of those things that people would hate uh, well, not hate, but it, the mundane things. Yeah. I was like, I love this. I love the fact I could buy her those those funny crispy stick things, the organic things, you know, that you give them. Yeah. I mean, every, all of that was just uh, so amazing that I had little Tupperware pots of snacks for her, that the raisins were her sweets and that she had a dummy and that I was constantly doing washing and I just would be... I, all of that was such... A joy and still I, I'm every day I am I love I love the process of being a mum I really? love how it's changed and grown and that sounds like I don't have dark days and that it's all perfect it's not but I it's sometimes horrific um but you know it's just well that's the thing I isn't do it because if, every child they go through stages you go through stages you stop listening to each other then you start listening to each other again and I think yeah parenthood is that is that it's that push and pull absolutely it, you grow with your child don't you mm. and you're you're you learn as you go along and um I just I feel very very blessed I would I've love I love it and I loved the whole thing from you know feeding and looking after her and going on to you know what food that she really loved and and then to her making stuff and then to her going to school and you know all of those moments you know the painting and the dressing up and oh the walking home from school together and all of those things the school plays I, I've loved them I love them do you think your own child childhood has played a part in in the life that you have with Billy I would think it really does I think that um I've probably recreated quite a lot of it for her and you know so much so that every birthday she has she wants her family and our sort of close friend group 
on every birthday. She wants the same cake that she's had every year. And she, you know, she, you even though it? she wants to see her, yeah, make her the same <laughs> cake every year. And everyone's like, strawberry cake? And I'm like, yep. <laughs> and she is, a, <laughs> this year she had Colin and the strawberry cake. So she still, sometimes she, you know, she wants to have Colin the caterpillar like everybody. Yeah. But she also, and she's had different cakes along the, you know, like great big Scooby Doo van cakes, amazing things I, I've had to try and make. And some of them people have made for me. But there's always been, but I want the strawberry cake on my actual birthday. So even if she'd have a party, the strawberry cake is the birthday cake. Well, seeing as we are both Ocado lovers, I guess now is a yes. good time to talk about food. Um, one thing in your book, actually, that I, I, I know I keep referencing the book, but I loved it, is that you keep oh. going back to food, like different recipes and stuff that you that you turn to at different times. What is the one meal that puts a smile in your tummy that you're just, you know, either it's a pickup day or um, it's just something that, you know, a down day that you need a little pick me up or something that you just know is going to make you feel good? It's always, always going to be a roast. It's really? just that's just it. It's always going to be like m- my favorite is roast chicken, and every time I smell roast chicken, I feel like everything is all right, everything's okay. There's a roast chicken in the oven, which means roast potatoes. Um, and as long as I have roast potatoes, uh, uh the world is a good place. I love that. I feel like that should be a quote as long as I have roast potatoes, the world is a good place. I loved your roast potatoes that you did oh, for Ricardo, and you yes. did your roast potatoes, and you were like, Oh, I'm a bit worried about them because they look a bit, a bit jumbled together because they would like you cook them. Yeah. That's exactly how I do them, really, because then they have the crispy bits on. Oh, that's love, that's how I you love, need them. I love, ro- I love roast potatoes, are definitely my favorite thing. Uh, Tom has tried to like, he starts adding in garlic and all sorts now just like leave my roast potato method alone okay back off yeah yeah, it's good it is one of my favorite things ever a roast potato yeah I just think uh, to me a roast is always it's always that sort of hug the smell of a roast is is a hug to me and it makes everything feel safe and that is from my mum definitely do you have one every Sunday we used to until our, all our kids have told us they're so bored of roasts and that we're not allowed to have them. So we haven't had a roast for ages. I think the lock, lockdown and roast dinners turned them against roasts. And in fact, the other day they said, when are we going to go back to roast dinners? And we were like, whenever you want. <laughs> you were the ones that have all said no. You've boycotted it for the last year. But I mean, with you um, two as parents, they must have, like, you've got quite a wide range of stuff that you can oh. cook for them, surely. Uh, do you know what? Gee, everything they ask for, they get. What do you fancy for dinner? Billy says, oh, I'd like Korean fried chicken made. <laughs> uh, can we have, uh, you know, chicken milanese tonight? Or can we have tacos? Or can we have this? Or can we, I mean, can we have pho? Anything. Yeah, of course. <laughs> and it's just made because we both love cooking. We both think, oh, if we don't know how to make it, we'll make it. John knows everything anyway. Um but yeah, they are. They don't know how lucky they are in the food department, I don't think, and they don't care. <laughs> but food has always been such a huge part of your life. Yeah. I, I mean, my grandparents were obsessed with food. My mum was obsessed with food. When we'd go on holiday, my grandparents would phone us up and say, did you have a nice time? And we'd go, yeah. And then they'd say, and what did you eat? And we'd go through <laughs> what we ate. And we and my dad's phone calls, every time we talk to each other, the majority of it is, what did you have for lunch? What are you having for dinner? <laughs> that's, that's, that's our whole, whole phone call. <laughs> that's exactly the same. And John and I do it constantly. So it's just the way, to me, it's, it shows, if I can cook for somebody, then... They, I, they, I can show them how much I love them. I suppose I don't know. Yeah. I, I love cooking and I love feeding people. Um, my stepkids call me the feeder. <laughs> <laughs> there are worse things to be. Yeah, yeah, the feeder and a pushover. <laughs> oh, they call okay. them pushover Lisa. So yeah, you know, <laughs> a nice balance. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, so if you were to write a letter, actually talking about letters, um, there's something very special that your mum wrote you a letter and I know that you keep that she did. really close. So at the end of every episode, I actually ask people if they were to write a letter to someone on motherhood, who would it be to and why? But you actually have a letter that your own mum wrote to you. I do. And 
I have it. It's the one thing I would save if the house was on fire, apart really? from obviously my child. That was the only that uh, my husband, of course. Sorry. <laughs> but I mean, <laughs> I mean, as in, I know where it is in my room, and I would grab it because it's written by her, and it was just you know, just things like put your shoulders back, be your own person, don't follow the crowd. You know how much I love you. It's it's an incredible letter that must have been really difficult for my mum to write and she wrote it when she was very ill and I've kept it with me. And um, I just, it's it's something that I can hold on to and look back on and sometimes I just need to read it and know, know my own strength. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And sort yeah. of where I came from because that's really important to know your where you're from, mm. you know, I think. And that's something from her that was... Yeah, so Men important. For you and, you know. Yeah. And it's just for me, not yeah. just me and my sister, because me and my sister, obviously, we were, we were lumped together a lot yeah. in my mum's eyes. So it was lovely to have something that was just mine. And obviously, she's got her letter. Yeah. So if you could write your own letter now about motherhood, who would it be to and why? It would be to Billy. Mm -hmm. And it would be to Billy when she's about 30. Right. <laughs> 25 to 30 stage, yeah yeah and I think I just would love her to understand everything you know she obviously has a book that I've written basically for her but it would be to to understand that sometimes us mums we don't always get it right but what we are always doing is thinking about our ch children and how to keep them safe and loved and as cushioned as possible in a world where you have to let them go. Um, so I think that it would be a letter to Billy and to, to tell her how much she made my life. <laughs> Isn't it crazy how, you know, there is that definite feeling of meant to be. You know, I know that it comes with so much different emotions for different people, but, you know, there's just a, yeah, it, like you say, yeah. look, it's meant to be. I, I really think you you find your child or your mm. child finds you. And, you know, if you don't become a mother, there are loads of ways to become a mother or to mother. Yeah. It, not even to have an actual child, to actually do something in the world that is mothering, mothering. in some way. Yeah. I like the verb. Um, but my, my daughter always says meant to be and she says the bees for Billy. <laughs> and they're meant to be and I'm like yeah actually very very good girl <laughs> and we finish each episode with you answering well finishing three sentences so the first okay. one is being a mum means being a mum means the world to me since having a child I since having a child I realise that I was, I'm still very much a child myself and that I have to practice patience and um, that I never stop learning. The patience thing is interesting, isn't it? Because I always feel like uh, there'll be moments where you think, I've got this. I have got all the patience and I've got all the skills and all the tools that I need to get through. And uh, not only just get through, but help them thrive and be brilliant. And yeah. then another moment will come along and you'll be like, I don't have any patience at all and I've not got any skills or tools. <laughs> That's what I mean. You're constantly, like, it's a, it's a battle between patience and learning and yeah. working out that, oh, right, OK. So we're on another learning curve and we get through it yeah. and then it settles for a bit and just as you start relaxing, in fact, it means don't relax because <laughs> yeah. the minute you do, something else happens. Yeah. It's, the, it's the whole, you know... May, just embrace whatever it is if it's bad embrace it it's a moment it will pass if it's good embrace it because at some point it's going to go and you're going to be back onto a bad moment exactly so enjoy those moments when they're yeah. there yeah and the final sentence is I'm happy when I'm happy when I'm making dinner the house has got music in every room and it's full of our children and the dog is by my feet trying to get scraps of whatever I'm cooking. <laughs> Do you make extras for the dog or not? <laughs> well, me and John always cook and, and John used to be like, he wasn't a dog lover now, he loves her. And when John and I are cooking next to each other, we've got the kids everywhere, he's feeding the dog scraps. So she just sits by his feet whenever <laughs> he stands up. 
<laughs> it must be so lovely for you and John to have something together that you, that you enjoy doing together, like like cooking. It, it really is. I think we're very lucky because we can, you know, we've we've got a new series coming out and we've got some recipes to test this week and we're so excited. Like, well, he, I'm going to do this. And he said, well, you do that and I'll do this. And, and we start, like, sort of thinking, OK, so it becomes... It's just lovely. We bounce off each other and, and really enjoy cooking. So, yeah. In my head, lucky. I've got... So when I was a kid, I used to pretend I was a Blue Peter presenter and I used to do things and narrate it. In my head, yeah. you and John are stood in your kitchen going through it like you're presenting it for the show. Do you know, when anybody comes over, they go, it's just like watching your show because they sit <laughs> at our bar and we're cooking and chatting and they're like, this is a bit surreal. Um, I just, yeah. But I know I used to do it with with little b- pots of um, food, like yeah. Delia. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Lisa, thank you so much for coming on and having a chat. No, it's a pleasure. Thank you. It was lovely to see you. And you. <laughs> on Zoom. On Zoom. <laughs> <laughs>